Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057. This is Introduction to Law, we're into week 10. Thank you um, all of you for being online. If you have any questions as we proceed, please feel free to unmute your microphone or ask through the chat facility. If you haven't joined us for the live sessions, well, it's not too late, we've got two weeks to go. So please consider joining us next week or the week after if you're watching this as a recorded session. Last week, I gave um, an indication of some homework that I'd like you to do. And also significantly, I released information about the take home paper. So we'll talk about both those things tonight. We'll talk about some other issues, particularly in relation to ethics and um, some general issues that um, we need to cover before we complete this unit. Now, before I start, any questions of a general nature? All right, well, we'll just get straight into it. Um, just a reminder, of course, that on the Moodle page, we now have the, the ability for you to provide your say. So if you haven't already done so, and thank you to the six um, who have already provided their say, what you need to do is go to the left-hand side, top of Moodle, the landing page, and you need to record information, which is the have your say button. Um, I don't believe it will take long. I certainly appreciate it, the university appreciates it, and it provides us with excellent degree of feedback. All right, um, at the, um, uh, look, let's get straight into the assessment. Um, that might be probably what people are thinking about anyway, and then we can talk about the homework and deal with some other issues. So I'm going to share the screen. What you should see now is the information guide that I've posted on Moodle. It looks very much like the assessment itself, doesn't it? And um, the reason for that is that it's, it is very close to the assessment. So when you find the assessment released on the 10th of October at 6.30 p.m., it will look very much like this. So we'll go through it. I don't usually release it in this detail. Um, in week 10, I usually provide some indication as to what you can expect. However, the key words here are that this is a difficult paper. You would have read that at the, um, in the opening paragraph of the task description. So with that in mind, that's why I'm giving you more information this unit uh, in this offering than I would normally do for other offerings. And um, the reason I'm doing so in part is to have you well prepared, to have you well motivated, and also to do some preparation work even before we start. So I'm giving you the green light to do whatever preparation you work you see fit as a result of knowing at least this part of the assessment that I'll release on the 10th of October. So when I do release the final assessment, you'll have just over 29 hours to complete in total 2,000 words. The, the, it's in two parts. And the first part presents you with three hypothetical scenarios you're required to reflect on the work that you've done over the previous 12 weeks. And in each case, in each one of the three parts, provide a response of 500 words per advice. Now, these are all problem-based questions. Part B, two questions, 250 words per question, total 500 words. So in part A, we've got 1,500 words and in part B, 500 words total, therefore 2,000 words. For the first part of part B, you'll also need to undertake legal research as you will for each of part A. You'll use your legal research skills to reply, reply to these problem-based questions and I expect that you'll use your toolkit. So the aim of the toolkit, um, the aim of the toolkit is for this to be a, a document that works for you. Sure, as you'll see in the feedback, I do want you to send, spend some time talking about general principles, but really I think the best toolkits are those that provide you with an opportunity to work through a problem and say, I've got this, here's the legal logic, here's the legal research, here's how I'm going to put it all together, is how I can write like a lawyer. Now, I appreciate that most of you won't become lawyers and um, in many ways, having a law degree now is a general degree. 
to assist you in a whole range of areas. But the way that I've taught this unit is, if, is, is as if you were going to be practicing as lawyers. Now, I guess we look at it in terms of, we've taught you legal logic, how to present material like a lawyer, how to research material, and how to write answers as a lawyer. So it only makes sense that the bulk of the question for the final assessment will be, look, pretend you're a lawyer and provide some information. So that's the logic behind it. The idea, of course, is that um, you use these skills in whatever endeavour you choose with your law degree, once you have the law degree at the end of the course. And for those of you using this as an elective, at least it gives you an opportunity to um, think like a lawyer so if you're briefing lawyers, if you're involved in a legal dispute, you've got a head start as opposed to what you would have if you hadn't undertaken the, um, the unit. Let's go back to the paper. Um, and just as I'm doing that, I'll indicate that um, I hope to have the feedback and the marks for you in relation to the second assessment by this time next week. Ideally next Monday, but the workload is pretty severe at the moment for me. So, um, sorry, I'm going to, I've stopped the share. I've given you the wrong information. That's um, some of the notes on what we will be talking about when we've completed the task of looking at the take home paper. So hopefully this is the correct share. No, yes. All right, so on your screen, you should see the take home paper information guide that we started to look at earlier. Working, now we'll look at the notes. So working to a short deadline is part of the assessment. As you know, I'll release the paper at 6.30 p.m. If I'm running a bit late, please excuse me, like this evening, for example, it's all a bit rushed. But um, it will be as close to 6.30 as I can make it. And what I tend to do is um, announce it on Moodle. So in the latest information, you should see that I've announced the paper and I should also generally put the paper on the Moodle landing page. So you can expect to see it um, where you see the laws 110557 take home paper information guide as a PDF. And you can see that now. You can probably see the paper will actually be there at 6.30 p.m. on the Friday or Thursday I release it. I'll also release it generally through the assessment itself. So you can follow the link and you'll see it there. And usually I'll send it to everyone through a news forum item. So one way or the other, you should be able to find the paper pretty quickly. <clears throat> now, of course, you must complete your work and submit the work by 11.45 p.m. on Friday the 11th of October. You'll prepare a single Word document, not a PDF, but a Word document, and each one of the answers to parts A and B will be included on a single Word document. You don't have to have a cover sheet, many students do. Um, that's fine, it doesn't count towards your words. Um, footnotes don't count towards the word limit either. But some unit coordinators really don't like if you load up the footnotes with substantive content uh, on the basis that that really should be part of the overall um, paper that you're preparing. Now, unlike the first two assessments, I won't provide you with a marked version of feedback or personalized feedback, but I will prepare some general document that provides you with an outline of what it is that I was looking for in the various questions that I provide. Now, the next point is important, and that is that um, this is not an invigilated examination where you're locked away and you're not able to confer with each other. So, what it means is that you are entitled to consult with others at your discretion with your peers, I'd suggest, um, but the final answer must be yours. Now, the reason I say peers, it means within this group. From a practical perspective, 
it would be very difficult for me to police if you went outside the group and sought advice elsewhere. I hope that you won't do that. I hope that you work on this yourself, but you can discuss it with people within the group. So the message then is if you haven't made contacts within the group, probably a good idea if you attempt to reach out and do so. You might recall at, on day one, I had a, a, a list saying, or I had a forum discussion, join a study group. If you are looking for someone to work with, then perhaps you could put an entry there. It also means that you can um, uh, have some discussions about the, the question. So the final answer must be yours. If you want some further information about collusion, collaboration, then have a look at the academic policy, which is part of what I wanted you to do this week anyway. So any questions so far about the assessment or what I've said? All good? All right. I'll continue the share and hopefully this will come up as the take home paper. So there's a 2000 word limit in total. I'll be a bit flexible if you find that you really could use some, some of the words that you save in one part of the exercise by using them elsewhere, then that's okay. But don't go beyond 2,200 words. And even if you go beyond 2,000, I'll be scrutinizing the use of words um, more carefully. Because these are problem-based questions, they have to relate to a legal problem. And I understand that you haven't done any substantive law subjects. So here's the odd thing about this exam. I'm going to examine you in relation to things that we haven't discussed at all and you haven't read about at all during the course of your study. And on the face of it, that's patently unfair. However, what is the purpose of what we've, what, we, what have we tried to achieve? I've tried to get you to think like lawyers and research like lawyers and write like lawyers. So that's what I'm testing. And because of the, I'm asking you to answer legal problems of some substance, it means of necessity, they'll be, I'll be asking you substantive law questions and you haven't studied it. So the task is you've got the 29 hour period or whatever you choose to use within that period to undertake some legal research. But before you do the legal research, um, you, we'll just have a chat about this generally. What do you think, if, you, if you're given a substantive legal problem, what do you have to firstly identify before you start to do some research? Feel free to unmute your microphone or use the chat facility. What's a logical starting point to answer a legal problem? I imagine um, the first, Yes, Paul, I'll start with you. I imagine the first thing that you'd want to find out is uh, what area of law you're trying to research and what the issues are, uh, that sort of stuff. Yes, yeah. so there's certainly Iraq, two of the early I, things to think about. What is the area of law? What are the legal issues? Now, I didn't catch who else was speaking, sorry. That's okay, that was me. Thanks, Renee. Um, I was going to say to identify what are the material facts. Yes, I think that's very important as well. Um, and, you know, you may go through this in a logical Mirat, Sirac type style, or you may just use that as general thinking. Um, so Gary says, question is, uh, whether it's an actual legal issue that needs legal rectification. I like your thought process there, Gary. So you're thinking more holistically as well. And that's, if that's what you're getting at, and that's true. It may not require a strict legal um, answer, but odds are it probably will. Um, all right, so they're the key issues. Now, once you've identified the material facts, you've identified the legal issues, you then need to do some research. And what are you researching? What are you looking to find as part of your legal research? Um, yes, Paul? The, the statute law, the case law, any um, uh, legal principles that apply to the case as it is? Yes, 
Okay, very good. So statute law, case law, which are the primary sources of law, or you might research using secondary sources such as textbooks. Rachel says the applicable legislation. I think legislation is always the important thing to identify first if you can. So essentially um, we can we can describe the primary sources of law and the secondary sources of law as we need to find out the legal rules, don't we? Once we've done the research, we think we know what the law is in relation to the area. And this of course is after we've identified the issues and the material facts. What's the next thing we need to do? Apply. Need, that's it, Paul's got it and so have others. Chris says apply the rules to the facts. Suzanne says apply the rules to the facts. Gary says, identify the section breached. So yes, we need to start working on an answer, don't we? We need to give some logical explanation of how these material facts and these legal issues marry up with the legal rules. And ultimately, what do we come up with? Doctrine of precedent, says Lucy. Yes, that's part of the legal reasoning. And Rachel says the conclusion, as does Chris. Now, what happens if you come up with a conclusion that is the direct opposite of the conclusion that I arrived at in relation to a legal problem? Does that mean you failed? No. Does it mean you could potentially get 100%? Yes, absolutely. Because I'm not gonna pretend that I necessarily know all of the answers correctly. Because as I've explained before, one of the great things about law is that you can have your opinion, how the law applies to a particular set of facts and come up with a completely different conclusion to me. And I can still give you 100% marks, all right? So Emily's got it right, as long as the reasoning is valid. So what that means is you don't have to stress so much, do you? It's not a maths question. You don't have to come up with the exact answer that's 14.12. You just have to identify the identify the ballpark. You know, we, look, this looks like a problem that relates to this area of practice. I'm pretty sure these are the material things. These are the things, it's pretty much common sense that a court would take into account. Sure, in the problem they've mentioned this and that, but I, I think they're furfies. Um, write well, um, do some research on the area and put it all together. And then even though it's a difficult paper and at first glance you'll say, I don't know, by the time you do undertake the legal reasoning and the legal research and put it together, you might be pleasantly surprised at the, um, the way in which uh, uh, you've performed. All right. <clears throat> um, so when it comes to the legal research, can ask and just a yes or no is fine. Do you think you've got it mapped out in your own mind where you'd look and how you would look for these things? Yes, good, unsure, hopefully. All right, some, some good answers there. Your toolkit should help you in this regard. You've already submitted your toolkit. I'll mark it, I'll send it back for assessment. Feel free to strip it now and redo it the way you want rather than the way you think I wanted it. Um, I try to emphasize do it the way you want um, but some of you may have put in things that you think I want or you might have put in some fillers. So use your toolkit now, have it ready to go to answer legal problems. Okay now just a quick poll. Um, we know that particularly in part A of the assessment there'll be some legal based problems on substantive areas of practice. Quick fire now, can you just identify for me what you believe are areas of legal practice? I'll start you off, criminal law. Okay, so we've got criminal law, contract, family law, priestly 11, torts law, administrative law, any others? Commercial law, succession law. Constitutional law. Constitutional law, yep. 
litigation. And there are more, aren't there? If you if you thought about it for what negligence and tort, if you thought about this for a bit longer, you could probably come up with a list of about 30 or so. Now, from what areas of practice do you think I have drawn these substantive questions? Could be any one of them. Um, it could be any of those 30. All right. So one thing you probably, yeah, Renee's got the, the right answer. Yeah, probably they're going to be different. Um, it's unlikely that I'll choose multiple questions from the same area of practice, but they could be from anything. And so it's completely arbitrary. Um, and I can't give any hints about that. So you're on the right track. We need to be ready for anything, as it were. Okay, let's go back to the individual. Uh, we'll go back to the assessment and share the screen once again. So I said there that you haven't undertaken substantive law subjects. That means that you'll need to be good with identifying your legal research. Um, so have some have some things ready to go. Make sure that you can reference in accordance with the AGLC4. Um, so even though you're preparing this as a written assessment, um, which is a take home paper, the general rules apply in relation to referencing material. So when you get to the rubric, please look primarily at the advanced column because that will give you a good idea of what it is that I'm looking for in the answers. And then you'll see by way of further explanation what it is that I'm looking for and go to the HDs and see if you can work towards those requirements. Now, if anyone's looked at this, you might be horrified by the last thing. You would have referred to appropriate legislation, case law, rules, practice directions, etc., whatever that means, and ethical issues. Now, we haven't necessarily talked about practice directions during this unit. Does anyone know what I mean by practice directions? Anyone come across them? Yes, says Gary. Question mark. Directions put out by the court, says Renee. Yep, that's it. So given that we are looking to have you answer questions that are legally based and practical, if you come to the conclusion that the matter needs to be litigated, then you'll get the best marks if you can identify where the litigation should be commenced and whether there are rules of practice that might be relevant to that litigation which is a tough ask, I appreciate that. Um, if you go to um, the court's website, you might find some practice directions. The bench books that we've talked about might assist you as well. Don't be too hung up about that. That last comment that I made on the um, rubric is something that I do for all units um, throughout law. So if you don't don't stress if you can't find any practice directions, there may not be any, but I'm just asking you to think quite widely in terms of the advice that you provide. We'll go back to the take home paper and we'll look at the tasks. So. The assumption is that you're now a practicing lawyer, you sit in with a partner of the firm, and you see in the one morning you see Kareem, and you, then you see June, and then you see Rob. Um, you don't know what those attendances are about, so when you see the actual paper, there'll be a lot more detail under client one, client two, and client three respectively. So there'll be an extra page or something um, there. But the notes following the discussion will be the same for all of these. And the idea is to give, the idea of these notes um, made by you following the brief discussion is to give you an idea of what it is that I'm looking for. So I'm looking for something that's practical in nature. I'm not looking for a theoretical advice. Now you might think, well, that's all a bit vague. What does that mean? 
I'll try to explain that a little bit more. So the scenario is in part A, that you're sitting with Margaret and together you see three clients. Now you don't, you're not involved in it, but you're taking notes. And at the end of the interviews, at the end of the day, Margaret says, look, I need you to do some research for me and send me a memorandum. Now in this scenario, I'm Margaret, so to speak. So you don't need to tell me if the, if the contract relate, sorry, if the question relates to contract, you don't have to answer the problem-based question as if it's an essay. I don't want you to say, the law of contract commenced in medieval times where it was recognized by courts that someone makes an offer and someone accepts it, et cetera. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is an answer to the problem. You've only got 500 words. So by all means, if you believe that identifying the elements of a contract is relevant for answering the question and necessary for answering the question, then please do so. So if, for example, you think that there's some real argument about whether there's been an acceptance of the contract, then you can say, in order to have a valid contract, amongst other things, we need an acceptance. And I'm not sure that we have an acceptance in this case, then that's an issue, isn't it? So therefore you've got to mention it, but you don't have to give me the background to it. Um, if you've got a property based question, you don't start by saying, unless it's relevant to answering the question, that important legislation to do with property law is the Property Law Act and the Land Title Act um, of Queensland. I mean, Margaret knows that already. So you don't need to tell me that. You need to dive into the answer in a more substantive way. Have I explained that well enough? Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? All good? All right. Um, I mentioned also in the letter, sorry, in the assessment, excuse me one moment. I mentioned that um, ideally you'd tell me the court or the tribunal, whether it's state or federal. And this may become apparent from your research. So when you're undertaking the research, um, you may find that there are some cases decided in a particular court or a particular tribunal. And that will then prompt you to say, Okay, for this type of area of practice, we're dealing with the matter in the Planning and Environment Court. So I'll make sure that I put in there somehow, even though Margaret probably knows this, just to, to show that I've thought about the jurisdiction, I'll casually mention that we, if we're instituting proceedings, we'll do so in the Planning and Environment Court. Um, if you're really advanced, if it's a criminal law question, you might tell me if it's some um, in the magistrate's court or the district or Supreme Court. Um, if it's a family law matter, you might tell me if it's in the federal circuit court or the family court, you know, things of that nature. But don't be too hung up about it. And um, it's very unlikely that uh, the person who gets the very best mark in this class has dealt with everything. So you, apart from the fact that you can get full marks for coming to a conclusion that is opposite to that which I conclude, there's a very good chance that you can now uh, get full marks, even though you only provide a response to half the things that I think might be relevant. Does that make sense? So it's a hard paper, but it's marked with a sensible degree of difficulty in mind. So therefore, um, I'm not gonna mark it terribly. I won't be marking it, as hard as the paper appears, if that makes sense. All right, um, so have a look at what it is that um, I've indicated there to get an idea of um, the type of response that I want. Then in part B, again, there'll be a problem-based question, but of a different style and then an essay question. All right, and then, and then you'll be done for the unit. So are there any questions on what I've said so far? All good? All right, thank you very much. Now you had a chance to do some homework.
Um, let's see if we can answer some questions now. And um, your client asks you to initiate proceedings. And the client wants you to consider an appropriate court or tribunal for a debt of $5,000. Did anyone do any, oh yes, we're into the answers already. Chris read my mind. So which tribunal or court? We're getting some votes for QCAT, says Chris. Tani says QCAT. Rachel says QCAT. Can anyone tell me what part of the QCAT tribunal would be the appropriate section? Small debts. That's what it used to be called. It's called something slightly different now. It, um, the QCAT was an amalgam of about 29 tribunals. One of them was the small claims tribunal. So now it's the minor civil disputes jurisdiction of the QCAT. Um, but you can still proceed in the magistrate's court if you want. So you can go either way. Why would you choose to go to the magistrate's court instead of QCAT for this type of debt? Because there's no right or wrong answer here. Well, it might be because you want legal representation. That's part of it. Or you want to recover your legal costs from the other side, which would be very difficult in the minor civil disputes jurisdiction. Now, what if the debt is $50,000? Where would you go? Queensland Civil Magistrates Court, Mag Court, Mag Court. Yep, great. What's the jurisdictional limit between the Mag Court, the Magistrates Court and the District Court? $150,000, thank you. So um, when would you go to the Federal Court instead of the Queensland Supreme Court? for a commercial dispute, for example. What would be the basic distinction between those two? Now, bearing in mind, there is cross-vesting jurisdiction, which came into effect in 1987, but Rachel's got it. Depends on whether it falls within the Commonwealth jurisdiction. And the general rule is, have a look at the legislation. So if you're looking at the Bankruptcy Act, which is Commonwealth, odds are that you'll probably be going to a federal based court. If you're looking at the Property Law Act, Queensland, odds are you'll be going to the Supreme Court. So that's not hard and fast rule, but it's a good rule of thumb. Um, and there may be some specialized courts and tribunals that you need to consider as well. All right, so that's all I plan to talk to you about in terms of jurisdiction, but do, do have some preparation, do some homework, think about the jurisdictional limits, the type of court for both criminal and civil matters as best you can, so that if you have that question, you've got some way of easily determining what is the appropriate jurisdiction, court, tribunal, etc. Now, I mentioned the CQU policy as part of the homework. I was particularly concerned to ensure that you are on top of what we mean by collusion as opposed to lawful collaboration. Has everyone had a chance to look at the CQU academic integrity policy? You've been able to find it. I think I, I think I even produced it. Everyone's read it. You've got it at your fingertips. We've all read Humsey Hancock's case, haven't we? We know the importance of integrity, but by the same token, we know that within the rules, we try and work together um, to produce a result. So that collegiate attitude. Anyone have any questions about that? If anyone hasn't read the integrity policies, please do so now. All right. Now, <clears throat> next part of the homework was to do with ethics. Everyone has a copy of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. Would that be a fair assumption? Everyone has a copy of the Barrister's Rule. That would be a fair assumption as well. Have we read them to a degree? I'm not saying word for word, but have we dug them out? We've looked at the headings. We've got a feel for it. Honest answers required, and we're getting a lot of good honest answers. Yes, thank you. 
if you haven't already looked at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rule or the Barrister's Rule, then please do so now. I've identified as part of the homework the key rules for you to look at. I'm not necessarily here tonight to ask you questions about those, but from a solicitor's conduct perspective, you need to know the fundamental duties of solicitors, rules three, four, five, and six. You need to know the rules about dealing with clients, which is rules seven through to 16, make sure that you're particularly aware of the obligation at Rule 8.1. You need to know solicitors' rules in relation to advocacy and litigation. And that is Rule 17 to 29 inclusive. And then 21.2 provides that a solicitor must take care to ensure that decisions made by the solicitor to make allegations or suggestions under privilege are reasonably justified. So whenever you're answering a legal problem in this unit or any time, please consider ethics as well. Whether the examiner asks for it or not, you are required to consider it. So in the legal problems that you have in your assessment, question two, who's the client there, June, there might be some, this is not a hint, this is not necessarily a hint, but there may be an element of the instructions that give you cause to be concerned about June's capacity to give instructions. And if that was the case, you'd need to know two things. In addition to the substantive law, you'd need to have some idea of, some understanding of the law relating to capacity, and you'd have to have some understanding of the ethical rules that relate to you receiving instructions from a client in circumstances where you're not entirely sure about the person's capacity. Now, do we either know where to look for these things or we're committed to be able to look for these things in the next two weeks? Can I have some yeses and nos? Yes. It's a loaded question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and if it's no, then please ask some questions find out. Um, if you're really stuck, ask through Q&A. And for the barrister's rules, have a look at the advocacy rules, duties to court, duties to client, and responsible use of court process and privilege. Um, I hope that you've all had a chance to look at the video involving <coughs> His Honour, Dean Morzone, <coughs> um, Judge Morzone as he is now, who was a um, a QC at the time I did the interview with him. All right, let's go through a scenario now, um, an example if you like, and we'll think about what you would need to do if you're answering this question. So thinking caps on, listening carefully. Assume that you have received instructions to act on behalf of a client who's pursuing an unpaid amount which according to your instructions is payable under a contract. The contract was entered into between your client and his daughter. So when it says his daughter, so you're dealing with a male client. The contract relates to the sale of his car to her for an, an amount of money not yet paid. Excuse me, my voice is really... That's the problem we're talking all day, sorry. Um, the contract uh, is for an amount of money, it's not yet paid. When he arrives at your office, he brings a letter from his daughter complaining that the car was defective. She doesn't believe she owes the money because of those defects. So your task is to explain the options that might be available to your client in relation to the matter, outlining the advantages and disadvantages in each case give consideration to the nature of the court or tribunal where matters could be commenced, and also perhaps any alternatives to litigation. So just in general terms, when you're taking instructions, there are a few key rules. So I'll mention these things to you now, and you can then make a note of it. The first is to listen very carefully and actively. By active listening, 
I mean, you're trying to identify things that might be missing from the narrative. I'll stop there. When you come to answer any of the legal problems in the assessment, or any legal problems beyond this unit, here's a very important thing to consider. And that is whether you are making some assumptions in providing your answer. And if you are, and it's an important assumption, then you should identify that in your answer. So for example, um, can anyone tell me, and this is a really vague question, but based on what I've said, has anyone made any assumptions already that go to the jurisdiction generally of this matter? It's a very vague question. I'll provide the response. You can answer me this yes or no. Um, Glenn says QCAP. Now it's a little bit more basic than that. When I read that question, did every one of you assume that we were talking about a contract that was made in Queensland? What if after you've initiated proceedings, you find out that this contract was actually made in the United Kingdom because that's where they came to the agreement and that's where the daughter lives, that's where the car is. The client didn't think that was important. Why would that matter? But it might make a difference. So you can see that <laughs> classic stitch up, says Chris. So when, you're, when I ask you to think and listen actively, I want you to be very careful about identifying any assumptions that you might make. And if potentially they're important, write it down. Start your paper by saying, I assume this is a contract in Queensland. Great marks, you know, um, good thinking. If, however, you think that there are things that are missing in the narrative that are important, then there's nothing wrong in saying in the problem, um, here's the assumption I'm making, but in order to, before proceeding, we need to clarify these points, A, B, C. All right, so when you take instructions, listen carefully. Then consider the nature of the agreement. Was it a contract? If it was, was it verbal? Was it in writing? Um, because I haven't actually said it's a contract in writing, have I? Did anyone make the assumption it was a contract in writing? You didn't? You were prepared to go either way with that? Good. All right. Well, that's an important thing. Just say, I'm assume, I assume it's an oral contract because nothing was provided in writing, but we need to check that point. That's great. Great work. That's the sort of thing that Margaret would want to be reminded of. So avoid the gotcha situations. We don't know the purchase price. We didn't say that, did we? We just know it's an amount of money. So we'd have to identify that. Why would that be relevant? We've already answered this to some degree. Legal costs, jurisdiction. So Matthew's right, Chris has got the answer I was looking for, jurisdiction. What is the court or tribunal that we should go to? It, that may depend on the price. <clears throat> Next, was the car sold as is or under roadworthy certificate? What was missing from the scenario? We didn't talk about whether it was a roadworthy certificate, did we? Does it make a difference? Um, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. But that's the sort of thing that you might want to consider. Therefore, and it leads to other things, is the potential for third party liability as part of your advice. Can we sue the person who wrote the roadworthy certificate? So what is the extent of the defects claimed? What is the approximate cost for rectification? Do we need to engage an expert to look at this? Is another issue. So you're thinking about the evidence that might be required if the matter goes to court. What was the condition of the car when sold? I mean, if the car was $500 and it was completely beaten up, then it's hardly fair to complain that I'm not paying because the car was completely beaten up. Um, <clears throat> but if it's a $50,000 vehicle and it broke down the day after um, it was acquired, 
then that might be a different story. In this situation, we're talking about father and son, sorry, father and daughter, so acknowledge the relationship between the parties. Why would that make a difference to the advice that you might give? Intention, that's a good point, Matthew. So Matthew's raised an issue here that it may be that the parties did not have an intention to enter into legal relations because of their relationship as father and daughter. Um, Suzanne says, well, maybe we should look at mediation a little more seriously than we might otherwise do if the parties were not related. Gary says, well, maybe we need to consider presumptions. Emily says, dispute resolution options. Matthew says, intention to create legal relations. Um, Rachel says, solutions, ADR, etc. cetera. Um, other issues, what about now, do we know how old the daughter is? Did we assume that she's an adult? What if she was 16? Would that have a bearing on your answer? Capacity, entering into legal relations, is she a minor? So when you're taking the instructions, you are really working hard and you're carefully considering all of these assumptions that you might make. <clears throat> Did, were there any representations? So one, the question doesn't say here um, that in selling the car, the father said, this car is top notch, it's ace, there, it's perfect condition. Likewise, we don't know if the, the father said, look, I'll sell it to you, I really don't want to because it's really in bad condition. But if you're willing to take the chance, I don't mind selling to you. So you can understand how that discussion would be potentially very important. So all of this goes to two things, identifying the material facts, ident well, three things, identifying the material facts, stating presumptions that are made, and number three, identifying missing facts. So when you've got your toolkit, I would have thought that these are the sort of things that you'd have as reminders, first things that you do to remind yourself to answer the question properly. Consider any independent evidence that might be provided. Do you need to get experts? Um, identify the appropriate legal issues. Now we mentioned earlier a bunch of different types of areas of law. So what are the what is the area of law or what are the areas of law that might be relevant to answering this legal problem? Any thoughts? Contract law, contract, yes. Anything else? Potentially. What's another area of law that might be relevant here? Family law, maybe, but I get what you mean. Property law, maybe. Torts and negligence, maybe. We've identified capacity. That's an area of law, isn't it? Um, and commercial sale, yep, that's relevant as well. What about consumer law? Ah, yes. Who said consumer law? Someone did. No. So consumer law might be, Chris got consumer law. So that might be relevant as well. So as part of your legal issues, you'd have to consider, well, does the, does the um, Australian consumer law apply to this transaction? Margaret might want to know that sort of thing. So Margaret doesn't want you to tell her um, that a contract requires an offer and acceptance communication, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, unless it's relevant. And it might be there in terms of intent number four is intention to enter legal relations. So that's an element of a contract that might be relevant here because of the relationship. But also we might want to know if the Australian consumer law applies. Um, did anyone make an assumption about when this transaction occurred? Did anyone think about that? Has anyone thought of, has anyone heard of the statute of limitations? We're getting a few yeses. If you haven't, that's okay but I want you to build that into your toolkit. I want you to make sure that you've, it, the toolkit's almost like a checklist. Um, what we don't want is to be caught out on a gotcha. And it may be that in answering your question, you might say, 
I'm assuming these things, it's in Queensland, it's within the monetary jurisdiction of the Magistrates Court. It's not statute barred um, because they've come to you saying, we want to pursue a debt. What if um, the, this sale occurred eight years ago? Would that have a bearing on your advice? Eight years, it's going to be statute barred, isn't it? So there's not much point going too much further in the conversation. Um, so then you'd um, need to pro provide preliminary advice to the client. Um, would you talk about legal costs? And if so, to what extent? If you've only got 500 words in answering a legal problem in the assignment, you won't have much time to go into this, but you might mention it as a factor. Legal costs generally not relevant in minor civil disputes, but they would be in the magistrates or district court. You'd consider other options. People identified mediation or ADR options as well. And um, you'd identify various risks with each of these things. So there's some of the things that you might consider in that simple, apparently simple scenario. Any questions, comments, all good? Okay. We might wrap it up for tonight. And um, I know it's a little early, but pretty close. That way we can start next week dealing with the issue of ethics. And um, after that, I'll move into another area um, to do with self-management and resilience before we wrap up in week 12. So before I finish for this evening, any questions, comments, all good? All right. Uh, question here, any preference on how to structure the response? Well, it's a memorandum to Margaret, but I'd still ask you to be reasonably formal because it's in a law firm. So you know some of my bugbears. Please make sure that you paginate this. Please don't use abbreviated language. Um, I should say, please do not use abbreviated language. Um, use short sentences to the point. Um, so, but it can be in a memo style. I don't think it would be dot point, um, but you might consider dot point, but there's no particular format. So yes, uh, I meant to say this. Now that you know the structure of the exam paper, I'm sure that within the next two weeks before the paper comes out, you would have, you would have had your paper mapped out. You probably have the introductory paragraph written. You'll have the headings there. You'll have um, uh, the, the document ready to go. So all of that you'll do in advance, I'm sure. Okay, any questions? All good? Right, we'll see you next week. All the best, bye then.